Hello, welcome to Lancaster Hi-Fi. I've had some good luck finding some nice stuff recently, and I wanted to share with you one of those finds in some detail. I have here a Phase Linear Model 4000 preamplifier. It even comes with the original owner's manual, circuit diagrams, and some test leads. Got it from a guy who, you know, seemed to be pretty competent in at least doing some work on his gear, uh, but he'd kind of given up on this. Um, you know, it, it worked. It works one way, but not the way it's supposed to. Like the aux outs work, but the main outs don't. It's a relatively high-end preamp. It's a quad preamp but it'll work for stereo as the joystick control for the balance, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I got it from this guy. He, uh, he shows me down into his basement workshop kind of place. He's got a bunch of drafting tables and he's got a computer sort of computer scope set up so he can show me that it works. I think really the main reason he was getting rid of it wasn't because he couldn't get it to work, which it was because he really couldn't use it in his living situation. He was getting noise complaints. And he, he probably listened to his music relatively loud because he, you know, in order to talk to me, we get down there and he puts in his hearing aids and he says, well, I got to see Hendrix live, so I guess it was worth it. Yeah, let's check it out. Here's the back panel of the Phase Linear 4000 Auto Correlation Preamplifier. Did a little research. This is designed by Bob Carver. And it suffers from some quality issues or just durability issues on the inside, and I'll get there in a second. It has this uh, auto correlation noise filter thing, and from what I can tell, it really has nothing to do with correlation, it just uses a bandpass filter. Okay, so. See lots of inputs and outputs. In this case, what was reported to me is these outputs don't work. This phono input is broken or loose or something weird. But that the aux outputs work just fine. Notice that these are new. All right, well, let's just look inside get the scope of things. So we've got one big circuit board here. These other boards are all plugged into it. And even the front panel board is mainly plugged in. There is, there appears to be one connection from that front panel to the rear, which is from the power. I believe that goes to relay back here or something like that, which controls the switched power supplies on the back. Sometimes it's interesting how easy it is to diagnose certain issues, such as these main outputs, which apparently don't work. Well, looks to me like they're not connected to anything. You see all these other input jacks and output jacks are all mounted to this bottom circuit board. And then the holes here are simply empty. In order for those to work, those center posts there need to be connected to something, and they're not. Now we do see two wires going from the vicinity of those missing those empty holes over here to the aux jacks well hard for you to see but that's where they go so that's why the aux output works it's just jumpered to the main output jacks which aren't connected so that should be a pretty easy fix <laughs> the uh the grounds on those, look at those, uh, they're just, uh, somebody just stuck pieces of wire sort of touching either the chassis or some other metal piece. 
which is uh, not really a good way to do that. Really do want to ground to the signal ground. Otherwise, it's looking decent in here. I don't see anything, you know, there's, you know, if we look at all these back planes, I don't, I don't see any corrosion indicating leaking capacitors. There aren't that many electrolytic capacitors anyway. Uh, check that out. Piggybacked. I guess to get a certain value, that's one way to do it. So not a huge number of electrolytic capacitors, which is good. That is, if I were to want to replace them, that will, there wouldn't be that many to replace. Although there are more than uh, might be apparent. A lot of the electrolytics have these axial leads. You know, what I would do, of course, is, uh, well, connect those jacks there. Oh, and then the phono jack that's loose or broken is broken. You can replace the ones that are broken there with new ones, similar to those new ones, but actually, you know, connect them. Deoxit, all these front panel switches, uh, probably fader lube the, the pots. Probably want to deoxit all the plugs where all these boards are plugged in. And then when I was reading on Audio Karma, I believe it was Gadget, said drop some lead on these. Every time one of these boards is pushed in or taken out, that's going to put stress on the solder joints for the plug down there. So, you know, obviously inspect all the solder joints on all these mechanical plugs. As somebody said, has sort of a made in the garage kind of feel look to it. Looks like this one was made on February 20, 1975. I'm figuring that's what that means. By somebody with the initials KL. And there's some handwritten labels. Tain, decoder, logic. See right and left. And some other numbers. So it's always fun to see the hand labeling. That's what gives it some of that garagey feel to it, or basement feel. Alright, well I figured we would check this out, take out one of these boards, and see what there is to see in terms of potentially cracked solder joints and that kind of thing. It's going to be a little more involved to get to the solder joints on the bottom there. Let's just check this out for now comes right out and, and I can just inspect it. I mean looks fine. It's a no solder mask. It's just a real bare bones sort of board. There's nothing that looks wrong but there's also that nothing that looks like it would suffer too much from just reflowing solder on here. You know like that joint there is kind of janky looking. I don't know what's up with that. Looks like maybe there was a, a pad lifted off there. Look at that, cute. April 3rd, 1974. Logic C4. So here's some janky shit. These resistors on the bottom of the board. And near as I can tell, somebody just snipped whatever was on the top and just glommed these on to the leads on the bottom, except that this one isn't even attached. Yeah, so I think the best thing to do in this kind of situation is to unglob that solder, pull out those old leads, and put these back on the top of the board where they belong. It, there's like, there's shit like this on every one of these boards, pretty much. I'm not going to go through and do all of them, but as long as I do need to fix this issue and I see clearly what's going on here, I'm just going to do it right. So that's much more attractive. 
So at this point, I've taken off the front panel, the bottom panel, and the top sides single panel. And boy. Now, it looks like the only thing keeping me from unplugging that front panel board is this ground wire here. Plus, this wire here is attached here. So I can unplug it, but I can't take it far if I detach this wire here, which is probably most easily detached right here. It's the thing grounding all the switch bodies. And some good news that those switch bodies are now available or accessible to get some deoxidant to. And of course the pots I can get in the fader lube in, no problem. And I'm inspecting this board here because all these headers, all these solder joints here will be stressed by plugging and unplugging the boards. And so I want to inspect those as I inspected on all the boards to make sure that those are not cracked. And resolder the ones that look even a little bit suspicious. Uh, where was that other thing? The main output was over here somewhere. Here, there, here's where those main out connections should be, but aren't. Eh, that's so fast. That is one continuous wire looped around each one of those screws. Which is actually a really good durable way to do it, but it does make it a pain in the butt to just disconnect. So really I guess the place that has to be disconnected is over here in the ground plane that soldered connection. When it comes to inspecting solder joints and looking for cracked solder joints, here's one that's probably just fine but it looks suspicious. So I'll probably reflow all of these. Upon closer inspection, that joint is cracked, as is the one next to it, although the next one is not an electrical connection, but a physical one, so should be resoldered just to make it strong. And again, I'll redo all of them to make sure they're all good. Here's an even closer close-up. connections back here but uh, okay so this one is for the CD player so ox there's my ox there's my ox so one interesting feature is that these are grounding plugs that is uh, when I put that tip in there it breaks the default connection which ground which is def by default the signal input is grounded. And when I put that in there, it breaks that ground connection. There's the preamp out. So I reconnected these. I did not fix the phono jack. There's two. And these are special grounding plugs, and so not, you know, I don't have any of those on hand. And uh, the ones I could find on DigiKey 
aren't going to fit on this circuit board, at least not straightforwardly. So I'm not sure what to do other than just live with uh, only having one phono connection. I also had to find just a random nut to put on there for the ground. Hoping I'll find something a little more presentable at some point, but in the meantime, that's what we'll do. Alright, I got it. Yeah, and we got the two sources, so it should do it. it. Looks a little off sitting, this huge thing sitting on top of the CD player, but the CD player is wicked heavy. I mean, I could, of course, put it up on top of here, but for now, this is fine. Well, we can do the full tour later, but uh, for now I'm just kind of eager to see if it's going to work. Also recently refurbished this uh, CD player, Sony X77ES. Okay. Set on aux. Volume's all the way down. Let's check it out. Well, so far so good, but it's got a whole owner's manual full of features to familiarize myself with. You might have noticed the blinking LED, that's the indicator that it's actively unlimiting it's an attractive piece. I'm pretty pleased with the way it sounds so far. Like I said, I've got a lot of sort of setup to do with it. It's a relatively feature-rich preamp. Alright, I want to explain some of the features and go about setting this up. And really the best source is just going to be the manual here. So I'm going to do a little reading from it. So here we have the unlimit threshold knob and what you can see is this light going off and I'll give you the brief explanation of that. The unlimit indicator lamp provides visual indication of peak unlimit operation. This indicator will remain operational in either position of peak unlimit switch. Here's the unlimit on, expand and out so that stays on regardless, but now I've turned off the peak unlimit function. The peak unlimiter, together with the downward expander, combine to perform a dynamic range expansion system. This system is designed to restore a portion of the dynamic range of live music that is normally lost during the recording process. Before discussing the operation of the system, Consider the following definition of terms. Compression is the function of intentionally altering the musical signal level in such a manner that loud musical passages are recorded more softly, and soft musical passages more loudly than the live counterpart. Peak compression refers to the compression operation being performed exclusively on brief musical peaks, and is generally referred to as peak limiting. Low-level compression refers to the compression operation performed on very low-level signals and normally compresses the average signal level. This operation is generally referred to as low-level gain riding or upward compression. During the making of a phonograph record, compression is performed by the combination of an electronic compressor together with the skillful application of manual level changes by the recording engineer in parentheses, gain writing. During very high-level musical transients, a device called a compression limiter or peak limiter is employed at the recording studio to compress and limit the level of musical peaks. This is necessary to prevent a system overload associated with the mastering of the phonograph record. During very quiet, low-level passages, the recording engineer manually raises the overall recording gain in order to produce a recording that will be loud enough to cause the background noise level to be acceptable. The peak unlimiter is designed to restore to a significant extent the musical peaks that are removed by the peak limiter during recording. See scope photos. On the left, 
Output of recording microphone combined snares and drum of live recording. In the middle, the musical information of photo one after being compressed, taped, mastered onto a recording surface and reproduced with a modern phono cartridge. Note diminution of the snares at the peak of the high level drum beat. Note also the compression and loss of attack time associated with the drum beat. Okay, photo 3 on the right, the music of photo 2 after processing by the peak unlimiter. Note that the fast attack high level characteristics have been largely restored and that direct comparison with photo 1 is possible. The amount of peak unlimiter operation is a function of the time rate of change, the duration, and the instantaneous level of the input signal, the recording. Tracking is designed to closely complement the dynamics of recording studio peak limiters. The maximum amount of unlimit action is plus 4 dB, and the maximum attack rate is 0.5 dB per microsecond. The downward expander is designed to significantly restore the lost dynamics that occur due to low-level gain riding or upward compression during recording. The tracking of the downward expander is designed to closely approximate the dynamics of human gain riding. The rate and the amount of both attack and decay vary independently of each other and as a function of the recording engineer's application of gain riding. During moderate passages on the record, that is, during passages that are neither very soft nor very loud, both the peak unlimiter and the downward expander become inoperative in response to the fact that neither peak compression nor gain riding were employed during that time. It is this feature, together with the ability of the system to expand selectively, that allows it to perform the task of enhancing the dynamic range of recorded material. Well, let's see if we can hear a difference. That would be an interesting experiment. This is with peak unlimit off. Now let's turn it on. So I think you will have noticed an effect. There definitely is one. It seems to open up the sound a bit. It makes the louds louder. The quiet's quieter. Kind of neat. Well, that's a nifty feature by Mr. Bob Carver for moving from left to right here. So check this out. We've got left treble, left bass, right treble, right bass. So. We've got big shiny knobs with which to independently adjust the tone on the different channels. Now, right here we have this thing called Active Equalizer. And right now it's on. So let's see. According to this, Active Equalizer provides low frequency equalization to extend and flatten low frequency response of speaker system. A built-in active equalizer may be switched in to boost the extreme lows below 50 Hz. This is done because the vast majority of loudspeaker systems, even rather expensive systems, exhibit a gradual roll-off below 50 Hz. The boost is designed to produce a flatter, more uniform total system response and is particularly useful when used together with power amplifiers and speaker systems exhibiting high power handling capacity. So this is showing us, this figure is showing us tone controls and the equalizer. The dark lines are with bass set at 150 hertz and treble set at 2 kilohertz, which would be that setting. And the dotted lines, or the dashed lines, are the way I just put it with the roll offset 40 hertz and 8 kilohertz. And then the equalizer is this dotted line and that boosts us up 10 dB at 20 hertz. 10 dB at 20 hertz, about 3 dB at 50 hertz. Well, let's check that out. Let's see if we can hear that. 
Honestly, I had a hard time hearing that. And certainly if you're listening to this on your phone, you won't hear it at all. Of course, there's power. As I mentioned, the roll-off frequencies for the tone controls. Tone controls right now are off. Tone defeat. The pressing activates tone control circuits and allows use of bass, treble, and turnover controls. Raising switch restores flat frequency response regardless of tone control positions. Up position bypasses all tone control networks. Of course, we've got a minus 20 dB switch here. Which it actually suggests using that for very low level listening so that you have more control over the volume at low levels. That made a big change. Let's check out this thing because this is called an autocorrelation preamplifier. And so here is our big feature here, the correlate switch. And then over here, the correlation threshold. That has to do with noise. And uh, interestingly though, then that probably pretty much completely useless for a CD player. So the autocorrelator is a noise reduction system designed to remove noise from the signal source. The following steps should be used to adjust the autocorrelator. Step one, rotate the correlation threshold fully clockwise. Step two, check to ensure that the correlate switch is in the up position. Step three, put on a good quality record, advance the treble controls to full maximum, and activate the two kilohertz turnover switch and tone control switch by depressing downward on both. Select a portion of the record in which hiss may readily be heard against the musical program. Slowly rotate the correlation threshold counterclockwise. As the control is progressively rotated counterclockwise, a point will be reached at which the record hiss drops to a very reduced level, while the high frequencies of the musical program remain unaffected. Further counterclockwise rotation will have no effect on the program until a rather extreme counterclockwise rotation results in an abrupt and complete loss of high frequencies associated with the music. The correlator is said to be in lock when the threshold control is set anywhere within the two limits outlined above. Too far clockwise will cause the correlator to fall out of lock and noise will be heard, and too far counterclockwise will again cause the correlate correlator to fall out of lock with the result being a complete loss of highs. The correct setting is midway between these two limits. This setting is rather broad and not at all critical. The action is very similar to the familiar vertical hold control on your television set. You youngsters out there won't have any idea what he's talking about there, now will you? But pretty much everybody watching this video will know exactly what he's talking about. And when I say he, I mean Bob Carver. A correlator threshold setting too close to either extreme may cause the correlator lock-in ability to become impaired and, may, and it may occasionally and briefly fall out of lock. This is caused by random disturbances on the record surface. The symptoms of this condition are 1. If the control is improperly set too close to the clockwise limit, the correlator may momentarily fall out of lock and a brief noise pulse or a burst will be heard against the music. If it is set too close to the counterclockwise limit, a momentary loss of highs will occur. In general, a split-second loss of highs is never noticeable, but even the briefest noise pulse is highly audible and extremely objectionable. This fact suggests that if you should have a record that seems to cause the correlator to occasionally fall out of lock, the correlation threshold should be set somewhat to the left, counterclockwise, of the theoretically optimum position. This will absolutely ensure that an objectionable noise burst never occurs. After some experience has been gained in the operation of the autocorrelator, the treble controls may be returned to the settings normally used. And then there's a whole long section about the Dolby noise reduction system and the autocorrelator. 
explains that the autocorrelator differs from the Dolby system in that it is a single pass or open ended system which removes noise from the source without the necessity of the source material undergoing special encoding. The Dolby system is a noise preventing system designed to prevent additional noise from adding to the signal during tape recording. The Dolby system is a two pass or closed system which cannot remove noise once it has contaminated the signal, but prevents it from increasing during the tape recording process. Both systems provide approximately 10 dB of signal to noise improvement. It is possible to obtain a full 20 dB increase in signal to noise by operating the Dolby system in tandem with the autocorrelator. A tape recording that has been Dolbyized during recording may be de-Dolbyized by a Dolby decoder, then, pro then processed through the 4000 using the autocorrelator. And this is an interesting passage. An interesting psychological phenomenon occurs when high-frequency hiss is removed from the program source. It often seems that the absence of hiss is accompanied by a loss of high-frequency program material, when in fact no loss has occurred. At first, with certain kinds of music, the psychological suggestion that high-frequency material has been removed along with the hiss is very difficult to overcome. With other kinds of music, it is very obvious that only hiss has been removed. However, after a brief exposure to noise-free music, this psychological phenomenon seems to vanish as one becomes accustomed to a noise-free background. Once acclimated to a noise-free background, it becomes rather unbearable to listen to hiss-contaminated music. Historically, it took several years before Ray Dolby was able to convince the world his system was able to reduce noise without affecting the high frequencies. This situation was caused by the aforementioned psychological effects. So I find that fascinating. I've heard that before. And I'm definitely one that has suffered from that psychological effect. Perhaps we all have. Well, there you have it. I've not gone through all the adjustments yet. Uh, like I said, with a CD player, that autocorrelator function there is just going to be superfluous. But with a record, maybe not.